glad you're here. So we're going to be talking about the nine keys to unlocking service learning. And these are based upon our experiences interacting with faculty, students, and community partners about what actually makes an effective service learning course. So let's first talk about what is community service versus service learning. So community service is volunteer action based on meeting the needs of the community. And examples of this could include a canned food drive, a coat drive, or writing cards for residents of a, of a nursing home. So the projects are made to develop the skills of volunteerism. And volunteerism is basically altruistic, and it's about improving the human condition of life. Uh, often these are individual based projects, and they can also be court ordered at certain times. Now with service learning, we consider that to be community service on steroids. So <laughs> these projects are basically designed by the faculty member and the community partner. The project asks students to apply course material to community-based activities. So what this allows is for experiential learning on, in a context of real-world applications. And so this develops the habits of, of community engagement. So community partners also benefit by having their significant needs met by these volunteer students. So take, for example, a canned food drive. If it was a service learning project, the students may do research on hunger and homelessness in the community by reading local research or course materials. They may talk with the members of the, of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the food bank to find out what are their needs. So they may gather nutritious ingredients and talk with how to gather these ingredients and talk with families about how to implement nutritious meals in their families. Using math, they can graph the results of their canned food drive. And then by taking this information, they can present it uh, amongst community organizations, governmental boards, in order to affect change. So in closing, community service is not in integrated, and the curriculum is not community service. It's just service. I'm sorry, it's not service learning. It's just service. <laughs> so you may want to begin with yourself what you want to get from your um, course being service learning, and what you hope your students gain from incorporating service learning into your course. Um, next, you want to be sure to ask your partner what they need, because you don't want to go to a site and do service that's not really benefiting your partner. And lastly, you should um, keep in mind what your students need and what challenges they may face with doing service. One challenge that we ran into this year um, <laughs> was transportation. Some students don't come to campus with a car, and also parking is pretty difficult on this <laughs> campus. I'm sure you've experienced it. But um, one course had a class that um, went to a school in the morning, so when the students came back to campus, they couldn't find parking spaces. So um, we actually have resources available um, if you have that issue. We've uh, compiled a bus schedule for public transportation. There are also other um, options available for students to find help with transportation. Which leads me to um, why you should be doing service learning anyway. Um, there are a lot of benefits for service learning. Uh, literature tells us that students um, understand the material better and they tend to retain more information and enjoy classes more. Also, uh, students increase personal development uh, they learn what they like, their interests, and some actually discover that they may be um, heading down a career path that they're not as interested in and change career paths because of the service that they've done. It also increases student understanding of social problems, whether that's <coughs> in Birmingham or other cities in Alabama. And with any benefits, there are also barriers. One may be time limitations. Obviously, a semester is only so long, you have to cram um, a lot of information in that semester already, but service learning is meant to enhance the <coughs> learning and not hinder um, students' learning. So, um, <laughs> some faculty fear that they have a they may have difficulty balancing professional uh, uh, responsibilities with the service components of the course. I think it's important to remember that what works for one professor may not work for every professor. So you have to kind of develop your own way of. Um, service learning with your course. Um, also challenges with student readiness. This means like student maturity basically. Students come to college with 
I mean, various levels of maturity, and some may not have the service experience that others may have. So um, one way to kind of get over this barrier is to encourage students to go to an orientation with your community partner, or maybe if they don't offer one, to offer one yourself, um, just to give them guidelines as far as completing community service and, um, or service learning and um, what they should expect when they get to their site. And lastly, building sustainable service learning. So this is um, basically service learning that can get, continue after the semester is over. So the nature of semester, you know, you have different students each term. So that's a whole new group of students. You have to teach about service learning and kind of get them on the same page. And one way to get past this barrier is to establish a relationship with your community partner so that they know you and they know, you know what you're coming there to do. It also helps you to get to know the community better and that the community as a whole will know you and um, the service that you're going to be doing there. To guide them to do something, you know, mm -hmm. to, to make their the personal development. But uh, for the you know college students or the graduate students, it's how, how to do increase you know to do something mm -hmm. to increase the personal development and you know to for them for the social. You know. Yeah. Well, I guess my own story. I did service learning as an undergrad, um, and it was a medical sociology class. And I went into it thinking that, you know, I did not know what I would be doing. I actually worked with children, and I am not a teacher. I typically would not have, you know, just volunteered on my own to work with children. But after the service learning com uh, component of my class, I actually really enjoyed it. Not that I'm going to be a teacher now, but, <laughs> um, I mean, I really loved it. I loved working with the kids. And I think just that kind of personal growth, just learning more about yourself and maybe, you know, I guess changing your thought process, because that's something I would never have done on my own, but you know, taking that class, it was definitely a really good you know, experience. Okay, so that would bring me back to asking the question that Laurel was asking, mm -hmm. which is how do we assess the student's experience? Because one of the requirements that, that I have is that the students reflect on their partner, because I mm -hmm. want to make sure the partner's a decent match for me to continue in the future, and I also want them to realize that I do care about their experience. So what kind of questions do you feel that Laurel or I or any other professor can ask the students to reflect back to us so we know whether it's a good experience or how do we improve our communication with the partner and setting expectations? Yeah. Does that make sense? It made perfect sense. And we actually have a slide on assessment, and we're going to be talking about that in, in grave detail, and I have some examples and things like that. And I think Nicole has some as well. The handouts will get to that lot of questions yeah, for students. Okay, so I'm going to talk about developing your curriculum, okay? So we know what service learning is, right? Service learning is what? You just let them go do community service and that's the end of it? Is that service learning? No, you have an interactive experience and it's aligned with your course goals, the objectives of the course, right? So the first thing you need to consider is how will you incorporate service learning? Okay, that's the first thing. And so one of the things you can look at, is it gonna be discipline based? Okay, so we have a number of disciplines here. We I heard math, I mean, excuse me, biology. Anna said math. Um, I think I heard pathology, um, social work, business, a number of different disciplines. So how will you incorporate it? Will it be something that you gain content knowledge for your course, or is it to solve a problem? Okay, we have a number of societal issues as we know. So could it be how your particular discipline solves a problem in particular? Okay, and all of this is gonna come together and connect with the type of community partner that you choose, which I believe um, Anna will talk about as well. All of it, a lot of this that we're talking about overlaps and it kind of intertwines, like putting the pieces of a puzzle together. Um, another one is a capstone course. We know that that's a culminating experience for all the courses that a student takes throughout their matriculation at an institution. And what's really becoming popular is community-based action research, okay? A lot of you here are researchers. And service learning can be incorporated into a course doing community-based action research. I heard someone say they were in um, early childhood education, okay? So if you go into the community, 
You could have um, your students conducting research. Maybe it's for a daycare center. UAB has a child development center. So maybe they need a need met, and they conduct research, and they integrate the community, the parents, um, the students. So that's another way to incorporate service learning. And then lastly, in regards to how you incorporate it, is it mandatory or is it optional? Okay, and some people may think, I mean, but I'm doing service learning. Of course it's going to be mandatory. I'm the teacher. I'm telling them what they do. Not necessarily. There's some instances where an instructor may choose to have a service learning component of their class, and they may allow students to decide whether or not they would like to participate in that. One way to kind of combat any confusion is to maybe relinquish them from having to complete an assignment if they do service learning course, okay? And that service learning participation substitutes for a particular assignment or a number of assignments. What's important to know is just because you're doing service learning does not mean that you change the academic rigor of your course. Okay, it's not just a simple add-on that you just throw together and it's not that you water down your course. It actually enhances the learning because they're actually applying what they learn in the classroom. Which brings me to my next set of points, the syllabus. Okay, how many of you in here say that you've taught classes? I know it's about maybe half taught or are teaching. Okay, and the other half of you that may have not taught classes, you've all taken classes, right? You're affiliated with the institution. And the one thing that you constantly refer back to throughout the semester as a student is your syllabus. Even as an instructor, I'm a social work educator, and I constantly refer to my syllabus because you know that that is the contract between you, the instructor, and those students. So when doing that, you have to pay attention to a number of things. So we're going to refer to our handouts that we gave. I know we get, you all got multiple handouts. So we're going to look at two of the syllabi for me, and I'll have you look at the other one. You, can you pull the one that says ecotoxicology in the top left, and the other one that says an introduction to mathematical ideas? Do you see those two? And there the syllabi it has the UAB service learning logo at the top. Now, we chose these syllabi strategically because you would think math and toxicology, how in the world would you incorporate service learning? And we did that intentionally. When you hear service learning, you think about what? A lot of the service disciplines, you think social work, you think education, you think maybe psychology, you, you think those types of, of disciplines, but you can very well incorporate it in a math class or an ecotoxicology class. Another thing I want you to notice is hold a, a, each syllabi one in each hand. You can notice that one is much thicker than the other one, right? All of you have had classes or taught classes, or even some of your colleagues may have a syllabus that's a couple pages long. And some people think, hey, that's to the point. And some instructors think, that is absurd. How can they get what they need to know? And I've seen syllabi that are 40, 50 pages long because everything is in there. So let's look at the ecotoxicology syllabus first. I have highlighted at the top the course description, okay? The one that says ecotoxicology. The course description is highlighted. If you look at the last sentence, it clearly states service there is a service learning component of the course. That is the number one thing that you have to do when you develop your syllabus is ensure that the students know that the course is a service learning course. Um, to go back to your question, Annetta, about assessment and getting what students need to know, we've done surveys, and someone will also talk about that at the end of the semester through a big portion of our service learning classes here at UAB. And one of the questions is, did you know this class was a service <coughs> learning class when you registered? And if this says, if no, when did you find out? And unfortunately, if I may be candid, Libba, we, we did find out that some students did not know it was service learning until we walked in in December to give them that survey. Mind you, they completed the service activity, right? They expected to get a good grade out of the class, and they had done their reflective assignments, but they didn't know it was service learning which shows a disconnect, and no one is at fault, but we just have to do a better job at communicating certain things to our students. We had an incident recently, we were doing a discussion um, with students, and she was like, oh, service learning sounds great. I want to take a class. I'm in film. I'm in a class now. And then we're like, well, whose class are you in? And she told us the instructor's name, and we say, 
she teaches service learning, and I think that she's teaching one this semester. She was like, well, no, I wish I would have known because that can't be my class. So then we got confused, and we're thinking, is there more than one section of the class? And then come to find out, we were like, well, well where do you do your film assignments? Do, do you have a community partner? She was like, no, what's a community partner? That's another thing, the language. Community pro pro partner and nonprofit organization are synonymous, and sometimes it may not be a nonprofit. And so she was like, no, nah, but we go around in Birmingham and we do film and we work with these people and that people. We were like, you're in a service learning class. And she's like, oh. So it's very important to put that in um, your course description so students know that it is clearly service learning, OK? And you'll see in other areas of the syllabus where it's highlighted service learning, service learning, project, project, so students will know. And in addition to that, you have to look at your goals and objectives of the course, okay? And with that, your service learning component has to be tied to the goals and objectives of your course. Okay, if you're teaching a math class, you don't want the students going to a facility wiping dust off of plants and washing windows. I mean, that's a good service project because that particular facility may need that and may be short on their budget and may not have anyone to clean, but that has nothing to do with the math class and the goals of that particular course. So you have to concentrate on learning in addition to that. Also, the assignment should be service learning related. If you look at the other syllabus, the introduction to mathematical ideas, so the students know directly that they will be working in the community. It also says based on its needs. What did Rachel say previously? You have to make sure that you're meeting the community partner's needs. And then the instructor goes through and talks about all the different components that to need, need to be completed. Um, they can work in pairs or small groups. Now remember I talked about whether it's mandatory or optional. In this particular syllabus, for the sake of time, we're not going to go through every single part of it. You can, but in this particular syllabus, the service learning component was optional. This instructor allowed them to choose whether or not they wanted to participate in service learning. And the instructor also clearly delineated which assignment it would be substituted for, whether it was a test grade. Um, they allowed them to miss one class period if they chose this project. But it also stated that it's expected that you will be working on the project or meeting with your community partner when you miss that particular class. Okay? Um, and then the other section, it has project descriptions on there on page four. There's a number of uh, community partners and different projects. And syllabi also often have um, examples of community partners in there as well. Um, also, the text and the readings. A lot of times, of course, is some students read, some students don't. Some instructors put a very, very, very significant emphasis on reading the text and assignments. And of course, in a perfect world, we want all of our students to read. Um, and that's why service learning is also important, because not only are they reading and doing assignments, they're experiencing that and applying it in a real world setting. And so we've seen instructors that have an actual textbook that they use. I know um, in social work, Laurel and my field, we have textbooks that we use, but that's a big part of our um, social work education is actually going out in the field doing practicums and internships and learning um, directly. And then I've also seen instructions that instructors that pull together supplemental materials, articles, books that you can get in Barnes and Noble, maybe not a textbook, and those are the particular assi um, assignments to come from those books and readings and things like that in order to drive home the goals and the objectives that they're supposed to be getting in um, their nonprofit agency. Also a schedule. Um, the toxicology, as you know, is much thicker, so it's a lot more detailed. That syllabus actually has um, a schedule. Now, this is an older syllabus, but if you look starting on page 11, it has everything, an introduction to the course, the framework. It has when um, assignments are supposed to be turned in. The math syllabus has that as well. It has the date, the final date that a project can be given back to the nonprofit agency like the, the results of what they did with that agent. So they're very specific with the schedule and the outline. And lastly, the grading policy. We live in a day and age where students want what? What do they want? They want that A, right? <laughs> so they need to know what percentage of their service learning work will be applied to their overall course grade, OK? Um, we taught a class 
an intro to social work and they have to do 15 hours in a particular agency. And the student may get an A on every test, an A on every paper, and do an exceptional job. So that student will think, hey, I'm going to get an A. If that student did not complete all of those hours and those reflections and get their information signed by that nonprofit that they work with, that student will not pass that class. Because that's our policy. That's in our grading policy. And that just further substantiates the fact that this service learning component is important. It's not an add-on. It's not just something that you can choose to do because it was mandatory in that class. So the policy about how the service learning assignments, the hours that they're doing, that needs to also be clearly delineated as well in there. Okay? And then next, we'll, Anna will be talking about how you can align service learning with your course goals better. When you choose a service learning project, you want to make sure that it does align with all of the course goals you've outlined. You don't want to choose a project that is kind of out in left field, it's just a random volunteer experience. You want to make sure that it is providing your students with that enriched uh, learning experience that we think service learning will and should provide. And one example of a project that didn't align with course goals is we had, we reached out to one community partner about a partnership and the only opportunity they had that semester was counting beans and that really wouldn't align with any class. So again, no random volunteer work that can be beneficial in a different setting, but it won't enhance their learning experience in that particular class. So an example of this, if you uh, pull the syllabus that has community nutrition at the top. This is a syllabus, and again, this is like Jessica talked about, a very thorough syllabus. This teacher has 18 course goals outlined for her students. We're going to talk about the first three because 18 is a lot. So number one says the students will be able to describe the expanding role of the community dietitian. And then number two, understand and articulate nutrition problems and practices in the community. And then finally, describe the skills needed to deliver nutrition services. So in this class, she, this teacher wants a project that will meet all of those needs outside of the classroom. So the students have talked about it in class. They've addressed all these issues from their textbook in a lecture style. And now the teacher wants them to go out into the community and learn these things in a more hands-on experience. And sometimes we find that in service learning, that question you can often get as a teacher, what am I going to do with this? When am I ever going to use that? Can be answered in a service setting because they'll see, oh, here's where I use what we talked about for a whole week in class. Well, here's why it's necessary. So based on these uh, course descriptions, does anybody have an idea of what a good project might be, whether in Birmingham or just a fictional idea? Any suggestions to nutrition class? They want to learn about nutrition and what dietitians do. Yes? I'm wondering if um, you could hook up with a gym that actually has a dietitian on board that's working with potentially, if it, so a gym setting, or I'm thinking home health agency, or potentially, or maybe even a hospital, depending on if they can, if the HIPAA regulations become a real nightmare sometimes. Right, those are all great suggestions though, and if you flip over to some of the latter pages in the syllabus, page four and five and six, this teacher has outlined the projects that her students have previously worked on. And several of those ideas, a gym, a local health agency, are people that they partner with. So um, one is the Good Neighbors, Inc. So they offer on-site help and do presentations, all those sort of things. So those students are gonna see as they work with people, the issues that they are really having. And you know as a teacher that sometimes when you hand out a test, you'll have 15 students come and ask you the exact same question and then you realize, okay, this is something that we really need to address. That's something similar that they're gonna see as they work with these people because they may have learned like the six main nutrition issues that a community faces and then when they go out and serve and have one issue that comes to them 20 times over the course of 10 minutes, they've really learned, okay, this is an issue, and this is why I've learned this in class. And another example we have right here at UAB of a course that uh, initially the service learning goal didn't align with the course, but we uh, flipped it around so that it would. But Nursing 336 is a nursing leadership class at UAB that's required for all nursing students, and they wanted the, cur the course to be a service learning course. And initially, the goal was just to have students doing some general volunteer work that would be incorporated into the class. But when we started reaching out to community partners and they needed 
a lot because they've got 120 students, so they needed about 18 community partners. We found that the opportunities that were out there did not incorporate those leadership skills. Though they were doing great volunteer work, they weren't utilizing the leadership skills they were learning in class. So we kind of reanalyzed how we were going to do this, what would be more beneficial to really aid those students in what they were learning. And we decided that instead of just going to volunteer, they would plan a supply drive or um, some kind of drive for a community partner, plan it all themselves, implement it, go and deliver it to the community partner, and see the people that they've served and benefited. And that was much more beneficial to these students in helping them utilize these leadership skills that they were learning. And then next, which goes right along with this, is how to find that right community partner that does have an opportunity. And as they're working with people in the community, those people are going to have a diverse range of questions that the students are going to have to figure out how to address and how to meet the community's needs. So we find that those types of experiences are what really help the student increase their understanding and their learning and provide that enriched learning experience rather than just sitting in a lecture and writing down those facts and looking over them here and there at night. They've got to uh, use them to help others and the community. So that's what we find creates that learning experience. And as a community, community or people will accept getting knowledge from students, I mean from undergrads. Did you have some experience where students are going to public libraries to give something like clubs or journal clubs or something like that? We have not had um, any issues with the community being unreceptive to students, and that's mainly because we do have a community partner that is facilitating this project and supervising, so it's not the students just on their own. They are being advised and um, being told this is what does work, this is what doesn't, so we haven't had that issue. Any other questions? So next we'll talk about how to find that right community partner that will have a project that incorporates your learning goals. So the best community partner, as we've talked about, should have a project that fits with your service learning and class objectives. Again, you don't want your students counting beans if you don't have a class that's about counting beans. So students should be doing meaningful work that enhances both their classroom learning and is beneficial to the community partner. You want to make sure that your partner needs the services that your students will be providing. And if one partner doesn't have an appropriate opportunity, Feel free to say no and keep looking. When we got the Counting Beans offer, we said, I'm sorry, no, this doesn't fit. We'll be in touch another semester if you have something different. And again, this nursing class is a great example. We ended up um, lowering the group size to only get 11 community partners, and we're able to find some great nonprofits in Birmingham that needed either money or resources, books, all different types of things donated that these students could do drives for. <coughs> And how to create a partnership, this is a lot of information, but we're going to go through it all. So the best way to create a partnership is to email or call the community partner's volunteer coordinator. Most nonprofits are going to have that volunteer coordinator who knows all of the opportunities that they have in place for students or anyone interested in volunteering. You can also reach out to our office um, for assistance and ideas. We know a lot of the local nonprofits and who's in charge over there, who we can talk to, what opportunities they already have in place. So please reach out to us if you do need help. And then when you're talking to your community partner, there are a few things you need to provide them with so they know how to help you and how you can help them. You need to tell them what kind of opportunity you're looking for and what your students are, what you're wanting your students to learn and get from the opportunity. And then dates and times and, of course, the number of students that they're going to need to accommodate when they're there. And all of that, they're just going to need to know. It's better not to request a specific opportunity and just instead tell them what you're hoping your students to get. Because they may have an opportunity that doesn't directly align with what you were thinking, but it still fits. And an example of this is Episcopal Place is a local uh, nursing home. So if you teach a class that doesn't directly benefit those people, you may not think to partner with them, but they actually have an opportunity for volunteers to walk their residents' dogs, which is something that you would not associate with Episcopal Place. So lots of different nonprofits have a variety of opportunities that can benefit all different people and your students as well. Reflection, academic, or academic literature consistently says that uh, reflection is the key component to service learning. So without reflection, it's not service learning. So there are four C's of reflection and continuous, meaning that it happens regularly throughout the semester. So it happens before, like that first day of class, during and after, um, as in 
maybe a pre-post assessment of the class. So you have to make sure that it's the reflection is connected to your course content. Um, just as Jessica was saying, you want to make sure what you do with your community partner and your service learning is connected to what you want your students to get out of the course. It also needs to be challenging. So you want to give your students opportunities to explore, clarify, and alter their values because without reflection, you're just reiterating negative stereotypes. Um, an example of this is a professor had worked with the Donaldson Correctional Facility and she did a pre-post evaluation, a little survey, and she evaluated students' values and they, they actually changed afterwards how they felt about the inmates and the situation of the correctional facility. Um, contextualized is the last C of reflection and that's just corresponding to course content again and making sure the experience is meaningful. So the process for reflection of students is that you want them to explain their experience during the reflection. And, and we'll go over those methods of how they can do that and discuss what it means to them and identify the next steps, whether that's in a next reflection piece or the next time that they go and volunteer with their community partner. So this graph, um, I know Barbara and Laurel faculty fellows have probably seen this. This is just a great uh, who and when the students, how they're interacting with either the community partner themselves or the class, and pre, during, and after. And these are just some methods. Uh, some key things we saw were alone for the student to do is maybe write a letter to themselves, kind of like the Donaldson Correctional Facility, and they can go back after the class and read it. And another thing we saw was a letter to the next year, like giving, writing a letter to the students in the next cohort of what they got from the experience and what they need to remember when they're going through it. Um, as a group, in-class discussions and even using Canvas posts or blog posts are great. Um, and also with the community partner, maybe doing a presentation, almost like a public dissemination to the community partner, showing them what they learned by serving with them. And some other methods can be journals, essays, directed reading responses, presentations, like I said, photo essays, films, like the ethnographic filmmaking class. And also, this handout is actually another method of reflection. It's the deal model, a southerner, I can't say certain vowels right, the deal model, and it stands for Describe, Examine, and Articulate Learning. And it was developed by professors and faculty at uh, North Carolina State University. And it's a, it has some really great questions, and Netta, I was going to direct you to these, that they describe their experience, they assess, they assess their progress since the last reflection. And a great thing I like about it is that it examines experience from not only a personal perspective, but a civic and an academic perspective, which is really great when you're trying to make sure that negative stereotypes aren't reinforced and to challenge their thinking. Um, so these in-depth questions make for successful reflection. Okay, and I'm going, this is key number eight. Um, we inverted the keys, and I'm going to talk about conducting assessment. Um, so, Nicole alluded to this when she was talking about the Donaldson Correctional Facility. You can do a pre and a post test as a form of assessment. Um, it can be something as simple as having students like she said, to write a letter to themselves or to write their expectations. Like, what do you think that you're going to get out of this experience? What are your thoughts about inmates, people who've committed crimes? And then afterwards, you have them write another one. So you're doing like a pre-test and a post-test, and you're looking at the difference between um, what they thought prior to the service learning experience and after culminating that particular experience. Another way to conduct assessment is to use instruments and surveys that are statistically valid and reliable. Um, these things, they can assess citizenship skills. Nicole also alluded, alluded to that, which is like skills for political action, tolerance, uh, their social justice perspectives, their understanding of different community problems or how people have different perspectives about different issues, and also empathy. Right, because a lot of times you develop empathy, and we know the difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy is more so feeling sorry for someone, and empathy is more so understanding that person's particular situation. And when we speak to classes, we like to use the example of sympathy saying like, hey, I'm sorry this person 
doesn't have any shoes to wear, I feel bad for them, they don't have any, and empathy is more so, you know what, let me try to walk a mile in this person's walk without those particular shoes. So we try to give that example, and that's, it, it sounds easy to us, but it's a really difficult concept for students to, to gain, and the difficult skill for them to acquire. So it's really good to assess empathy amongst some other things. Um, and what we provided is um, some examples of actual instruments that are statistically valid and reliable that you can use to give prior to the experience, after the experience, or you can just give it one time after the experience. One of them is the Civic Attitudes and Skills Questionnaire. It's called the CASQ and it's used a lot in service learning and some professors at Tulane developed this and it's been revised over a number of years. And it has six scales. One is on civic action, interpersonal and problem solving skills, political awareness, leadership, social justice attitudes, and diversity attitudes. And just some quick examples of some of the items on the scale is, I plan to become an active member in my community. When trying to understand the position of others, I put myself in their situation. I'm aware of events happening in my local community. So simple questions like that, a lot of times assessment can be very scary or intimidating, but it doesn't really have to be. Another example of an instrument is the Global Perspectives Inventory. I don't know if anyone has heard of that one. It's available online through the GPI website, and it actually has three different forms. Um, and it assesses the students' perspectives um, on their interaction with other cultures, volunteerism, the impact of uh, global citizenship, and there are also items on there about coursework and students' co-curricular activities. And there are three different forms, a general student form, a study abroad form, and a new student form. And one thing we, that we did not mention is there are some um, online um, service learning experiences and international service learning experiences. And these different forms will help tap in to um, different questions that you can ask about their global perspective, whether or not they're here or abroad. Um, in addition to that, in regards to conducting assessment, you have to look at its wider uses and implications. And when I say that, manuscripts, right? When you think about, you're doing this class, <laughs> Laurel is smiling, <laughs> she and I are working on a manuscript together in regards to service learning. And so these, these surveys that you're giving out, you can actually write this up and publish it in a manuscript that has a high impact factor, right? And why is that important? for tenure and promotion, right? This can go in your dossier as well. And also conference publications, that a lot of conferences are, will, will be more than willing to accept you if you're, thinking, if you're integrating students into learning and you have some sound methodological practices to back it up. And then lastly, assessing your departmental needs and university needs. These are some of the bigger implications. A lot of the departments here on campus are accredited by their disciplines accrediting body. And you know you have to report measures and outcomes and all this different stuff when you're going through reaccreditation. And your service learning class could greatly contribute to that information. Um, and then lastly, for the bigger university's needs is SACS. Uh, UAB just went through um, reaccreditation and SACS was here. And they always want to know about student learning outcomes. Was it measurable? How was it assessed? And this is the type of information from a service learning course they can use to help buttress all of that um, as well. All right. So our last key to successful service learning is public dissemination. So when your service learning course is complete, you need to educate the public about what your students did. Um, you can do this with the UAB community by putting it on your departmental website or through social media. There's the Birmingham and Alabama community through media outlets or even through your academic communities through journals or uh, organizations. So when digital media's Anna Lloyd was a student here, she created this PSA, it's called Fresh Grown. And it features kids, they're promoting healthy eating and actually got picked up by Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, which is really exciting. So this was put out through, if you want to go to it, put out through the national community and also in the department, the UAB community, they posted on the website. So we're going to play that for y'all real fast. Green beans and collard greens, carrots keep me feet and lean. And 
and where the weather gets hotter, you know I'm grabbing for what? Keep the soda to yourself, I'm diving in like an auto for starters. I like fresh fruits at home. Fruits and veggies, guess what? They fresh grown. <laughs> Every semester there's an expo uh, for the spring. UAB Research will be having theirs April 10th and y'all students are welcome to submit their um, abstracts and posters to that. We welcome that. Um, and that is all for our nine keys to successful service learning. So if any of y'all have any questions, just 